welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof? Hello, Hello Walter. Walter. <laughs> <laughs> that was a synchronized attempt. Yes. Yes. Well, don't, don't bother about the other questions. Let's today. leave that out. I think you've got something interesting that you would like to mention. Before we start. Before we start. Yes. We received a letter from New Zealand. And it's a very sweet letter. And let me open it. It's handwritten and it's got some numbers and things on the top. And so I just want to show this letter because firstly I want to thank the person who wrote it and may the Lord bless him richly or her. I don't have a name because I assume there was something else in this envelope. It's been pasted closed and whatever else was in here is no longer in there. Because if you send something with a financial contribution to South Africa, I don't know, it seems that the people who handle the post have x-ray eyes. <laughs> they are experts. So we didn't receive it and we don't know who it's from. So we just want to say thank you. And I hope that the contribution that was in there, if there was one in there, that it will serve a good cause in the end, in spite of the circumstances. Yeah, well, maybe we can just ask then again. We've mentioned it to a few people that want to send us things via the post. Um, it's The chances of it arriving and getting into our hands is very slim. Yes, I've just heard of a parcel that was sent to me. And it was sent about oh, probably seven months ago. And they closed our post office. Yeah. They, just, they just closed it. I got a notice that there was a parcel, but there was no way to retrieve it. And now I heard after seven months that they found a parcel and it's at another post office. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a nightmare if you send something via the post. It's either via the courier, courier yes. or electronically or else uh, whatever happened to this one will happen to those as well. So yeah. that's just an, a quick uh, sideliner. A quick sideliner. So let's open with a word of prayer because we've got a very important discussion today. Our Heavenly Father... We thank you that we still have the opportunity to do these discussions. And we ask that you bless the discussion and also the viewers. And thank you for people that go out of their way to do your will. We ask that you all bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Martin, I see we have a rather lengthy title here. It's more like a description, isn't it? Yes, the that's title. actually... The, this is what the whole session will be about. So it's good versus evil, light versus darkness, church and state, salt and light, the great awakening, leading to the rewriting of the constitution, question mark, double blind. Yes, I just want to mention maybe those titles in the beginning, the good versus evil, light versus darkness, church and state, light, salt and light, this great awakening. There's a lot of sounds that's being made by the Christian world. So that is the kind of lingo that is being brandied around. And uh, it's very interesting. And will it lead to the rewriting of the Constitution? And what is this double-blind thing? We have to look at all of it. Because if you study your Bible, Martin, then you will know that uh, we are not dealing with straight up and down things. What you see is never what you get. Yeah. We are leading with, dealing with deception. He was a deceiver. He was a liar from the beginning. So what can you expect? Deception and lies. Exactly, and that's exactly what Jesus warned us about, um, against. Yes, and so often if you, if you speak about deception and lies, then people will want to question that and put it into all kinds of categories. But that's what the Bible says will happen. So let's look at this also in the light of double-blind. So we'll go across some 
news items and some videos, and we'll see how this fits into the prophetic picture, because that's always our aim, that's right? It. Everything that happens, how does it fit into the prophetic picture? Because once again, when you look at this, it can look very good from a Christian perspective. Yes. But that's where you have to be careful to see if it's not taking you in a direction that the Bible don't, doesn't want you to go in. Correct. All right, and these are all current that we're talking about. This is what's happening in the world today. And we need just to keep up to date. So our usual style is we will look at spiritual aspects and then we'll go into current events and then we'll look at the spiritual aspects because we do not want them to become divorced from each other. We don't want to... Uh, disintegrate into a news channel. We want to be a prophetic-based uh, organization, and that's what our, our studies are about. So Trump tied conservatives are 15 states away from an unprecedented rewrite of the Constitution. Now, it's interesting that they say Trump tied. Yeah. But you know, you can take that name Trump and you can take it out and you can replace it with anything else of a similar context. But this is what they're talking about. So with Congress's initiative, the U.S. Constitution has been amended 27 times. But never has the core American document been amended through a state-led process. The second track that the founders created under the Article 5 of the Constitution the conservatives are frustrated by Democrats' control of Washington, and even when Republicans are in charge, the growing size of government, the Convention of the States movement, is just one of the organizations pushing for such a convention. But it's perhaps the best funded and has made the most recent progress. And it has ties to the former President Donald Trump's orbit, such as former Republican Senator Rick Santorum. Now, about uh, a few years ago, I think it was in uh, 2012, I gave a lecture where I showed that Rick Santorum was very anti the separation of church and state. He was a presidential candidate at that stage. There's also John Eastman, the conservative legal scholar who supported Trump's effort to overturn the election. And five states, Wisconsin, South Carolina, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and West Virginia, have passed the organization's pro-convention resolution in the past two years. So, Martin, there's progress, right? Yeah, it's actually picking up. It's picking up. With Republicans poised for a wave election in November, more GOP-controlled states could join the pro-convention resolution crowd. And if that happens, well, then the Constitution can be amended. Mm -hmm. But we have to ask ourselves, what, what is it they want to amend and why? Yes. Surely it's not just about gun control. No, definitely not. And not only about this or that. There's specific reasons and those reasons are biblical. So we have to look at the role players mm. and we have to look at the mindset of the role players. Then we can understand where they're heading. Maybe I must just clarify. By meaning that the, those changes are biblical, I don't mean that it's correct. I yeah. mean that the Bible has in it prophecies that say that this can happen. Yes. Because whenever you deal with something like that, the first thing that uh, becomes a central talking point is freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Here's an article from Fox News. States one step closer in uphill, unconventional approach to amend the Constitution to limit federal government power. Now, this sounds very nice. There's a huge bureaucracy, you want to slim it down, and you need a change in the Constitution in order to do that, so they say. But is that really what is happening, or is this just the carrot? I, I believe it's just the carrot. A state senator calling for constitutional amendments said 
that overreach on the part of federal government has forced states to attend reform in a way never accomplished before. The Nebraska legislature passed a resolution in January 28 calling on states to begin the formal process to pass constitutional amendments that would limit the federal government's spending and jurisdiction as well as set term limits for members of Congress. It takes 34 states to call the convention and 38 states are needed to ratify an amendment. Nebraska was the 17th state, marking the halfway point to pass such a resolution since the effort started in 2013. Wisconsin passed one the week prior. The resolution has passed one chamber in eight states and legislation is pending in 15 more state legislatures. A convention of states under Article 5 has never been called. Amendments instead have been proposed through Congress. Only 27 have been added since the Constitution was adopted. So this says basically the same, just gives a little bit more detail. But we need more than one witness, so two or three witnesses is, is a good thing. Now let's look at some of the role players. Right, one of the role players is Rick Santorum. And here's an article from the August the 1st of 2022. And he wants the states to throw a live piece of ammo at Washington with a constitutional convention. So former Senator Rick Santorum wants Republican state lawmakers to throw a grenade at Washington, D.C. and pull the pin with the first-of-its-kind constitutional convention. He's pushing mm. for a rapid change. We need to know what's behind it. Remember, this is a former presidential candidate. Yeah. Audio of Santorum's appearance at the American Legislative Exchange Council, December 2021 policy. Summit obtained by the left-leaning watchdog group, the Center for Media and Democracy, and shared with Insider, reveal how he sells a convention to state lawmakers. Quote, One more state, and then you take this grenade and you pull the pin, he told a crowd of assembled lawmakers. You've got a live piece of ammo in your hands, 34 states. And if every Republican legislature votes for this, we have a constitutional convention. Santorum said a convention would reign in the deep state. Now, we've had so many talks about the deep state and the swamp and so many events taking place, like the raiding of the dwellings of Donald Trump and the encroachment on certain areas where people think that they should be left alone and in peace. And every time it is the deep state, the deep state. But we know there's someone behind the yeah. deep state. Because the Bible tells us who exactly. the problem is, right? And then he assured the assembled lawmakers that the GOP's interests would dominate a one state, one vote for the same reason that rural conservative areas have an outside influence in Electoral College and the Pennsylvania legislature. So he is propagating behind the scenes. There's an article from February 2012 when he was a presidential candidate. And he said that the speech that JFK gave makes me want to throw up. So perhaps we should just remind the viewers. And uh, I don't know it verbatim, but I know the essence of it. Uh, he said, I believe in an America where no pope or papal prelate will dictate to the government or the president or what he should do. And I believe in America where no Protestant prelate will tell the people how to vote. Because the separation of church and state has to be absolute. That's the essence of what he said. And Rick Santorum said that when he listens to that, he wants to throw up. Mm -hmm. Because he's of this old Catholic school. It's interesting that JFK was a Catholic too. Yeah. 
but he's of the school where he believes that the church wields the sword, the spiritual sword, and that the secular sword is subject to the spiritual sword. And uh, once you have that situation, then the church dictates morality to the state, and the state's duty is to implement it. That's what happened in the Middle Ages. Mm. And that's why the blood flowed for eons, and millions and millions of people died and were tortured. So when the Constitution was set up, that it was, it was necessary to prevent that from ever happening, happening again. So they wanted to prevent the bloodshed that took place in Europe from ever entering the shores of the United States of America. But the Bible says they will speak like a dragon. Yes. And the dragon is the one who gave the power unto the beast. And the beast is his lackey, mm -hmm. does what the dragon wants. And the dragon is the old serpent, the devil. Mm -hmm. So the devil wants to force you to do his will. It's called coercion. coercion. Mm -hmm. That's why if anything must, should make you throw up, it's any form of coercion, yes. particularly when the coercion comes from a church, Yes. no matter what church that exactly. is. Exactly. So this just shows you what the real reason is yes. that they want to change the Constitution. Correct. So let's read what they said then. Republican presidential candidate Rick Santorum says, the notion of religion not playing role in politics makes me want to throw up. Uh, he said more than that. He said that the fact that a pope or a Protestant may not dictate to the state makes him want to throw up. To say that people of faith have no role in the public square. You see, this is again a total distortion. Of course, everybody has a role in the public sphere. If you, if you vote, you have a role in the public sphere. If you uh, present an opinion, then you have a role in the public sphere. When you preach a sermon, mm. you have a role in the public sphere. So modern, basically, it's when they legislate their morality mm -hmm. that there is the potential for a problem, particularly if that morality clashes with the morality of the Bible. What kind of country do we live in where only people of non-faith can come in the public square and make their case. That makes me throw up, and that should make every American throw up, Santerum said on ABC this week. Again, that is a distortion, mm. because there's a vast difference of saying your say in the public square yep. and legislating morality. A big difference. Yes. The former Pennsylvania senator was referring to John F. K.'s famous 1960 speech that argued religion should be separate from politics. I don't believe in an America where the separation between church and state is absolute, he said. So this is just to show his mindset, his opinion. Yeah, it's totally opposite of what um, JFK said, but it's also distorting what he said. Yes. By the way, was JFK in the public square? Yes. <laughs> so this just shows that his argument is not relevant, right? Mm. Republicans' next big play is to scare the hell out of Washington by rewriting the Constitution, and they're willing to play the long game to win. This comes from the Business Insider of this year. We don't have to read it all because we've had the background. Let's just read the highlighted portion. Rob Nettleson, a constitutional scholar and senior fellow at the Independence Institute who closely studies Article 5 of the Constitution, predicted to Insider there's a 50% chance that the United States will witness a constitutional convention in the next five years. Whether it happens, he said, is highly dependent on Republican success winning state legislatures during the 2022 midterm elections. Now, this is just conjecture. It might happen, it might not happen. Not happen. Hmm? But if it happens, it will be quite substantial <laughs> repercussions 
Yes. Because we'll see what the mindset is, why they want to change it. Now, what's interesting, up until now, there's always been this balance of power. And one party could never actually do whatever it wanted to do because either they had a majority in Congress, but they didn't have a majority in the Senate, or the other way around, or some people were swayed. There was never an absolute majority in order to do whatever you wanted to do. So what if the pendulum swings, Martin? Yes. What if people become so fed up with liberalism? What if you open the floodgates so that people should become fed up and you bring about the pendulum swing? Then this could be a distinct possibility. I think if you just go according to what they stated there in the last two years, all those states that already joined in, it's telling you that there might be people that's getting fed up. Yes, they're getting fed up. Well, here's a video of someone who's also standing for the Senate. So let's have a look what they have to say, just to give us an idea of current thinking. I do not believe in separation of church and state. There is no such thing. The founders of this country, the founding fathers, they did not believe in separation of church and state. When you read the United States Constitution, nowhere in the United States Constitution do you read about separation of church and state. It does not exist. When I started this campaign, I made a decision. And the decision I made was rather than running my campaign through traditional Republican Party groups, I was going to run my campaign through churches. The reason is we're not going to save this country in political offices. We're not going to save this country in big corporate office towers. We're going to save this country in churches, in barns, and at kitchen tables throughout this state and throughout this country. The Judeo-Christian bedrock of America is the foundation of this country. America was founded on Judeo-Christian values, not on Muslim values, not on atheism, but on Judeo-Christian values. There's so many factors that separate that Judeo-Christian belief set from these other belief sets like Islam and atheism. And one of the main differentiating factors is our belief in good over evil and our willingness to fight for good over evil. Well, that was a rousing speech. Good over evil. Judea Christian culture. Now, Yes, we have roots in the Old Testament. Let's say that is Judea. And we have roots in the New Testament. Let's say that is Christian culture. When you mix the two, you have a certain dichotomy. You have a little problem. Yeah. Because according to the New Testament, the Old Testament is the gospel in type, and the New Testament is the gospel in antitype. It is the fulfillment of the prophecies and the promises. Mm. Now, if you take those two groups and you join them together, one accepts Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the other one does not. One keeps the seventh day Sabbath, the other does not, keeps the first day Sabbath. So even within that group, you have a dichotomy. What can make two opposites come together. A common goal. Ah. Mm. Pilate and Herod That's it. were enemies. But when it came to the crucifixion of Jesus, they combined their voices and from that day forth they were friends. friends. Mm -hmm. Now this is a very serious mm. issue. If you combine two opposites in order to achieve a goal, that goal might actually not lead you in the right direction. I almost think it most certainly won't. Okay. So although the speech sounds noble, and he says that the solution lies in the churches and in the private discussions rather than in government, and this is the forerunner of speaking 
like a dragon. Yes, and there's another thing that he also said, are willing to fight for it. Hmm. This fight is not the biblical fight with fight the good fight. This fight means actual, actually maybe getting into conflict. All right. And this, this fight will lead to coercion. It will. It has to. The, the civil war, the first civil war of the American, that was also a religious fight. Okay. He's talked about Judeo-Christian culture. Let's say they start legislating the Sabbath issue, mm. which is, of course, one of their favorite topics. Isn't there a dichotomy there? Yeah. Will one of them have to surrender their opinion for the sake of the common so-called good? Mm -hmm. Now, what if that opinion is contrary to the Bible? That's where it will head. Okay. You know, we can talk about all of these things until we are blue in the face. But just to set the stage, where are we heading? At the Commonwealth Games, they brought out this mechanical bull with all the ritualism of Baal worship. Mm. And there were so many programs and so many uh, from the religious side that were appalled at what was happening because it was obviously mm. a religious symbolic enactment. And then there was a woman riding the beast as well, which is, of course, the symbol of the ten horns. It's Europe. Because that's one of their emblems, the woman riding the beast. Yeah. And you will find it at the European Parliament. There will be statues of this. Now, we've spoken about all these things in the past. But such a blatant worship activity has seldom been seen. And so people think, where is the world heading? Mm -hmm. the, the evil is actually taken over and this is what we have to do, deal with now. So now they think. And you see, sometimes people can misinterpret what we're saying. Here. Yeah. We're not saying this is good. No. You must see what the, what's behind this. Correct. This is bigger than just this that's coming out. Because now they, you would have sympathy for a movement to get up to get rid of this. Correct. Now, just on that point, Martin, some people say, we, we speak euphemistically. We should come straight out and say it exactly how it is. Sometimes it's not wise to do that. No. And Jesus also didn't do it. He spoke in parables. Now the Pharisees knew that he spoke this parable against them, but there was nothing they could do because he didn't directly uh, address them. But he addressed the problem. Yes. And he opened the debate. So sometimes you have to be a little bit euphemistic. Now, we could also make this a soapbox and rant and rave about the evil that is going on in the world. This is just a symptom of a much greater evil. We know this is all there. And so this is part of a deception. Yes. So here we see how some people portrayed this. So they referred to it as worshipping the beast ridden by the harlot. Probably correct, mm -hmm. right? Or well, this one, a massive red herring, obvious demonic imagery to fuel the great awakening deception. That's a little bit more conspiracy theory mm. aligned. But the Bible is the greatest conspiracy theory ever written. And uh, yes, where is this leading to? And why are they so blatant? Because this can create a pendulum swing. That's now, whether they do it knowingly or whether they do it unknowingly is irrelevant. Who is the instigator, the one that uh, affects the mind behind the scenes? The serpent. The serpent, the dragon. The dragon, okay. Satan. Now, uh, personally, I think if you put something like this together, like this performance that they had, we could go into into detail. There are many, many videos about it. I don't think we have to. Then I would say they knew exactly what they were doing. Exactly. You see, there was actually a double blind in the performance as well because the commentators were saying this 
mechanical bull was the stock market uh -huh. and how in in the um, industrial revolution you see so the whole theme was around that but then the double blind is it's obvious that this was as well a Baal worship it was an act of worship because yeah. they knelt down they took praying positions etc etc so yes this was definitely something that would rile up the evangelical world mm -hmm and bring them to boiling point. So, so that's where it comes in now. So there's another deception because that's also done on purpose. Yes. And so what will be the result? I mean, you always have to think something through. Mm. Cause, effect, consequences. What will be the result? There will be a backlash. And people will say, this has gone far enough. It's time to take the reins of power. Is that a possibility? Yes. Okay, so let's have a few religious opinions on this just to set the stage and let's see what they say. The scripture tells us that in the last days that there will be strong delusion, which means that all the ancient deceptions and the ancient idolatry that brought so much destruction upon the ancient world is going to be repackaged and it's going to be brought back. And the enemy is doing that today, setting up the world for the acceptance of that person that the scripture calls the man of sin and also calls the Antichrist. What happened in Birmingham, England is really telling because we are living in that time when the adversary is trying to bring back Baal worship. What happened in Birmingham, England was really nothing more than an ancient ceremony that once again looked at the bull as a symbol of all the idolatrous practices and pagan beliefs that are now destroying the world. All of us now are in danger and there is not one person that is walking in America right now that is not under threat. We're being threatened by an intrusive government. We're being threatened by socialism, communism, and Marxism, and especially globalism. And what is being done is that this thing called wokeism is really repackaged Baal worship. So almost three years ago, there was something that took place where the Arch of Baal was taken around the world. And wherever the Arch of Baal was placed, and all the capitals of the nations of Europe, and here in our own nation, it was followed by a tremendous pandemic. And now the Commonwealth Games have come out and they are celebrating the calf again, like it was in ancient Egypt, like it was in Babylon, and like it was in ancient Israel. But God countered Baal worship by raising up the prophet Elijah to contest against the prophets of Baal. And we are going to see a manifestation of God's power on his people, on the redeemed blood-washed church in these last days that will indeed bring the forces of darkness to a standstill just before Jesus comes. The spirit and the power of Elijah is coming back on a glorious church before the rapture takes place and that we might experience a final revival and a last day harvest. Martin, my heart goes out to the man, but uh, there was a lot of confusion in what he had to say. He made a reference to the Antichrist. To them, of course, it is an individual who's going to come. He's already here. He's got full control of everything. And he's alive and well and sitting in Rome. And he was actually behind that. You see, with the serpent's help, he was the one instigating that whole thing. His, his army of Knights of Malta, of Jesuits and whatever, are probably deeply involved in anything that happens of this nature because he's cushioned himself. Mm -hmm. He no longer is the Antichrist and therefore he can do whatever he likes and be the hero at the same time. That's true. The focus has been taken away. All right. So that's the first great deception. Then they're waiting for the rapture and they want a harvest for the rapture. And so they want to take back the power. And then you have the kingdom people that want to set up the kingdom of, of God on this earth, etc., etc. So there's so much confusion in that. But the passion, mm -hmm. the anger, something has to be done and it has to be done right now. We have to take the power back because this is going to destroy us. Now, in no way are we saying that we think it was good what those people did. No. But it's leading us somewhere. It's leading towards biblical fulfillment. Correct. 
So, Martin, let's take this from a games aspect into the political realm and see what the commentators are saying about church and state and what will be the incentive to drive humanity in that direction. One of the strangest things about January the 6th for a lot of Americans was how many people in the pro-Trump crowd advertised their religious faith. Flags that read, Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president. Some people literally carried crosses to the Capitol and led prayer groups on that day. The religious right has been around for a long time, but this kind of political expression of religion, one not separate from but intimately connected to government, has grown increasingly common lately. We need to be the party of nationalism, and I'm a Christian and I say it proudly, we should be Christian nationalists. As long as we are confident and united, the tyrants we are fighting do not stand a chance because we are Americans and Americans kneel to God and God alone. The church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter and it means nothing like what they say it does. But what exactly is Christian nationalism? According to Christianity Today, it is a mass movement that believes the American nation is defined by being Christian and the government should keep it that way. Some of these faithful are even building patriot churches where parishioners pray that, quote, communism and socialism and transgenderism and homosexuality and abortion will not have their way in this land. And they're getting elevated in Republican politics like Doug Mastriano, the GOP nominee for Pennsylvania governor. Now, Mastriano is taking heat for his close relationship with Andrew Torba, the CEO of the right wing social media site Gab, who this week renewed his calls for an exclusively Christian nationalist conservative movement. So, no, we don't want people who are atheists. We don't want people who are Jewish. This is an explicitly Christian movement because this is an explicitly Christian country. Now, we're not saying that, uh, you know, we're going to deport all these people or whatever. You're free to stay here, right? You're not going to be forced to convert or anything like this but you're gonna enjoy the fruits of living in a Christian society under Christian laws. You're going to live in a Christian society under Christian laws. Mm. Martin, is that the church dictating to the state? 100%. Is that an image to the beast? Yes. That's what the beast was, That's right? That's exactly what it is, it's a state, um, religious conglomerate. Correct. The church dictating to the state and enforcing the church's dictates. All right. So now we've had an era of extreme liberalism. We've had a number of political movements in the United States of America, and not only there, but basically worldwide, where the restraints have been removed and everything that is considered non-biblical, has been enforced basically by legislation. And now we're getting a backlash. The pendulum is going to swing. And many of the issues that are being addressed in themselves are not bad issues. No, that's exactly where... So take, for instance, just the past few episodes that we had to clarify on which side we are, because this is the same thing. On what soapbox are you going to stand? There are many soapboxes to choose from. The issue is whose authority are you going to be subjected to? To say Christian, that's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Christian morality, Christian authority. You're welcome to stay, but you're going to be under Christian laws. Whose laws are those going to be? The papacy. Papal laws. Yes. And when they are papal laws, they are antichrist laws because they're contrary to the Bible. There lies the double blind deception. One of the titles that we had, Martin, was Salt and Light. Mm. So these are all movements that are taking place. Yes, they've got the, 
Jehu versus Jezebel spirit movement. It's linked to the salt and light movement. And that's again linked to the great awakening. All of this religious talk. And so eventually, what if you marry the World Economic Forum ideology with this Christian movement? Wouldn't that be a, a rather interesting roller coaster? Yes, because on the World Economic Forum, you've got the side of climate change for the same reason that you've got on this side this whole awakening. And on the one hand, you're decrying these organizations as communist mm -hmm. and deep state and what have you. And on the other hand, you're going to embrace them if there's something that you can agree with. And there will be a common one. There has to be a common factor. I wonder what that is going <laughs> to be. But let's listen to the Christian point of view. That you vote for Sherry Clements. She is going to do everything she can to be salt and light in this arena and try to get this district on the right track. Christians have have always been involved as salt and light influence in government in some of our most critical hours. We're supposed to be moving out here rather than backing up and saying, we should be involved with politics. We should be involved with everything. That's what salt and light is. It gets involved with everything. We must be engaged in reforming the seven mountains of the culture, not just affect what is inside the church. 2022 is the battles we're going to win in order to recover ground that was taken. And in doing so, the church is going to come to a new, dare I say, militant level of maturity. We're taking our government back. We're gonna run for school board. We're gonna run for PTA. We're gonna run for city council. We're gonna run for county board of supervisors. The public school system has become public enemy number one. We need to take back the education of our children because whoever controls the textbooks controls the future. 2022, this is a divine turnaround year. When this is overturned, which is at hand now, we are going to see the uh, really a third great awakening, signs, wonders, and miracles, repentance, sweeping across this nation. God's raising up an awakening voice in America, and the awakening is civic as well as spiritual. I see California awakening. The wind of change is blowing. The curriculum shall be changed by my hand, says the Lord, for I am releasing my anointing that shall break the yoke of woke. The answer for America is a revival. The answer for Gen Z is a revival. They gotta have an encounter with the Lord. We need people all over the country to be willing to put on that full armor of God. We will fight. And the way that we will fight is through the inbreaking of the kingdom of God to the earth and we will consume everything with the power of God and we will take back this world. Nobody, not even the devil himself, can stop what God has planned for this season, for this hour, for such a time as this. This is Isaiah 60. It's time for the glorious church of the Lord Jesus Christ to arise and shine like never before. And we are going to take this nation back. We are the army of God, and we are going to take this nation back. I think I would be optimistic because the people who will become the leaders of the world, this next generation, is people like us, the ones that are the, right the ones that are here actually out there fighting the good fight. Do you feel the winds of change that are beginning to blow across this land? The Christians that I speak to um, they all agree in theory about this Great Commission and that, yes, it has a civil application or civil implications. If we teach Jesus to obey or we teach, you know, disciples to obey all of Jesus's commands in every realm of life, it's that it's going to have an effect. And especially when we cross reference that and pair it with Paul remaining in the station that you were in when the Lord called you, the, you know, like governors are going to get saved or the jailer, Philippian jailer is going to get saved. People in positions of government are going to get saved. And then we're going to disciple them to obey Jesus commands as they apply in that station, which means they're going to have to legislate God's law rather than man's law, all those kind of things. Well, Martin, we're going to have to legislate God's law rather than man's law.
which actually means they're going to legislate man's law rather than God's law. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what it's come to because you are deceived. You are deceived into believing that the changed commandments are what God wanted. And you want to obey Jesus. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law. Yeah. Not one jot or one tittle will by any means disappear from the law. But they have not only changed a dot and a tittle and a jot, but they have changed the entire law. You know what? This type of movements and all this talk that we see now is the same that happened when Jesus marched into Jerusalem on the ass, on the donkey. Everybody was looking for that savior that we're going to take over the physical land again and rid them of the yoke of the Romans. This is the same type of movement. It's the same type of movement. Now, what's interesting, Martin, is that many of the speakers were actually exposed as false prophets because they said that Trump would win the previous election. Now, many of them, of course, will say he actually did win it. Because uh, that horse is not dead yet. But the fact of the matter is, what if he should come back a second term and win? They will say that they are vindicated because he will have a second term. Mm. Now, whether it is Trump or whether it is someone else, it is totally irrelevant. Could even be Pence or someone like that. Yeah. It, it wouldn't can... change anything because the, the Jesuit trained. Even if it's not a Republican, it's a Democrat again. It will also not change it because we've got the other side, but the pendulum side just is leaning a bit towards maybe a Republican. So that is a very interesting situation. But modern, does this fit the prophetic picture? Yes. Is this what we would expect? That the nation will be so riled up that they will set up the seven mountains, which is the kingdom of God on earth. Mm -hmm. My kingdom is not of this world, yeah. said Jesus. He's coming to destroy this. Exactly. And that is what um, we have to emphasize. We are heading towards a time where people of God are going to think they're doing God a favor in implementing laws that's not actually biblical. All right, now let me, let me at, the, at the risk of sounding harsh, say, they all condemned the Baal worship, but they're actually falling into the trap of Baal worship. That's, uh, that's unfortunate, and that's <laughs> so true. Okay, Martin, so let's look at what Trump has to say himself on some of these issues. We are a nation that in many ways has become a joke. But soon we will have greatness again. It was hardworking patriots like you who built this country, and it is hardworking patriots like you who are going to save our country. There is no mountain we cannot climb. There is no summit we cannot reach. There is no challenge we cannot beat. There is no victory we cannot have. We will not bend, we will not break, we will not yield, ever, ever, ever. We will never give in, we will never give up, and we will never, ever back down. We will never let you down, as long as we are confident and you know, the tyrants we are fighting do not stand even a little chance. Because we are Americans, and Americans kneel to God and God alone. And it is time to start talking about greatness for our country again. All right, Martin. So we are Americans. We kneel to God and God alone. So it all fits into this movement that is gaining steam. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have to bring in the other role players. So the World Economic Forum that is receiving some bad press, being the deep state or being uh, the mega rich or whatever they say about them. What is his relationship with people, for example, like Klaus Schwab? 
Let's have a look. Well, we're here meeting with world leaders, the biggest, uh, most important people in the world, and we're bringing back tremendous business in the United States, and they're all here to see. Uh, I'll be making a speech, and then we'll be leaving shortly. Uh, but I think it's very important. Uh, the other is just a hoax. It's the witch hunt that's been going on for years, and it's frankly, it's disgraceful. But uh, we look forward to being here. Uh, Klaus has done a fantastic job. And again, we're meeting with the big, biggest companies in the world, the biggest businesses of the world and world leaders, all for the benefit of the United States. We look forward to the meetings. Why not have witnesses? Is that right on climate change, Mr. President? Well, I'm a big believer in uh, the environment. The environment to me is very important. Thank you. All right, so he's a big believer in the environment. Klaus has done a great job. He's going to bring all the businesses back. Totally forgets that you'll own nothing and be happy, <laughs> which is totally contrary to the American dream. But uh, just shows how, you know, two opposite ideologies come mm -hmm. together and in the end find a common ground. Here's a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy that is perhaps enlightening in terms of the times in which we are living. By the parable of the householder who went into a far country after delivering to his servants his goods, Christ is represented. He is watching and waiting for fruit from those to whom he has entrusted his vineyard. But the issue is worship. No. The chosen people refused to be convicted of sin. And when God sent his son, they said, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Today the Lord is looking upon his vineyard. The walls are broken down through transgression of his law. He sees the ingratitude of his stewards, who refuse to render to him the fruits of his ground. God does not design that men shall appropriate all that the earth produces for their own selfish purposes. He calls upon them to bring their tithes and offerings into his storehouse, that there may be meat in his house, in India, China, Russia, and the cities of America, thousands of men and women are dying of starvation. The moneyed men, because they have the power, control the markets. They purchase at low rates all they can obtain and then sell at greatly increased rates and prices. This means starvation to the poorer classes and will result in a civil war. But is there enough anger out there for a civil war? Definitely. There's... You can see it not only in the other nations, but you see it brewing in the United States as well. Okay. Is it within the power of the nations to keep the price of oil and gasoline at a reasonable level? Well, yes. All that has to happen is the countries of the Middle East will have to increase their production a little bit, then the war that you have in the Ukraine should be offset by this? Well, even if you go and look, all the major um, energy companies like ExxonMobil and all of them had record profits. So if they just lower their prices without making billions of profits, that will also lower the price of... Yes, and if you put climate change into the mix mm -hmm. and you make sure that none of these fossil fuels are burnt but they're going to be burnt anyway because you're still driving your car, then all you are doing is increasing the anger. That's it. So you're stirring the chaos. Yes. So here's an interesting statement. Will result in civil war. Is there talk of that nature somewhere? Definitely. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Now Martin, when does that time come? Doesn't that time come when they say peace and safety? Precisely. So actually they've achieved what they were Wanting to achieve. Mm. We're back on track. 
So when they say we're back on track, we have taken back the reins of power, isn't that when sudden destruction comes? Yes. So is there a double blind here? It's a double blind. And this also shows you the nearness of this. All right. So there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, Martin, if you are going to be delivered, then what are you going to be delivered from? This coercion, oppression, and what is happening? Death. All right, because up until that time, deliverance was all about sin, deliverance from sin. But here will be an actual deliverance from physical circumstances, from legislation that threatens to kill you. Mm. The Bible says so. You won't be able to buy it, sell, and then the decree will go out that they can kill you. Yeah. Okay. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, when Daniel talks about the wise, who are the wise? The people that are studying the prophecies and adhere to biblical commandments. And adhere to the biblical principles. So, if you want to know about the doctrine, then keep the commandments. Mm. So what are the possibilities of these things happening? That the anger should rise to a fever pitch, and out of that fever pitch, you eventually get the order that is the image of the beast, which legislates on behalf of the beast, yeah. which is Catholicism. And uh, then it is the so-called Christian world united against this Antichrist who doesn't even exist because he's already amongst us. Yeah. That's how, where the deception, that's exactly how the deception is working. So let's listen to what this man has to say on ABC News. Sources tell ABC News there's been a strong reaction to the raid on extremists and QAnon-related forums. Sources say there's been a strong reaction to the raid on extremists and QAnon-related forums. Sources also telling ABC News there's been a strong reaction from some extreme groups online, including QAnon and other groups. There's been a strong reaction to the raid on extremists and QAnon-related forums. Including those that were active before January 6th. Including those that were active prior to January 6th. Including those that were active prior to January 6th. Involved in the January 6th insurrection. Including those that were active prior to the January 6th riot. Some have been calling for violence and even a civil war. Some of them include calls for violence and even a civil war. Some of them include calls for violence in online forums and even civil war. This was the top comment on the search on the pro-Trump site, The Donald, last night. Quote, lock and load with references to a civil war. Talking very violently about civil war. Searches for civil war. Spikes. They're talking about civil war. Civil war. Civil war. Civil war. Civil war. Civil war. This is the kind of violence that led to the January 6th attack. Martin, is that uh, repetitive propaganda? Definitely. Is we've, it uh, in line with what we just read just now? It's in line with what we read. We've also seen the effect of this type of propaganda in the last few years. And so the pendulum, I believe, is going to swing. No matter who the role players are, that's irrelevant. But the pendulum is going to swing. And there will be an image to the beast that will be set up. The same power of church and state united enforcing a morality which they call biblical, but which is everything but yeah. biblical. So, the evening news, 30 July 2022, Iceland shoppers demand law change as supermarket makes major announcement. Manchester Evening News shared the news on social media and the response was overwhelming. While many praised Iceland for the decision, most people saw it as an opportunity to demand the law change to allow supermarkets to close on Sunday. Martin, we're putting these in to show that there is this driving force behind the scenes for particularly one moral stature 
that they want introduced as legislation. That's exactly what's happening. Is it a popular call? Yes. Is, aren't we told in the spirit of prophecy that it will be because of the clamoring of the people that this legislation will be introduced? Exactly. Now, who puts it into the minds of the people so that they can start clamoring? Well, propaganda. Pro propaganda. <laughs> what? This is amazing. Okay. Angela Jackson said, don't open on a Sunday. End of. We used to manage, and I'm sure we'd manage again. Give staff a day of rest. Jen Wright exclaimed, good, should not shop on Sundays. You have six days to shop. Rest on the seventh. They're so confused, because that's not the seventh, it's the first. Ferry breakdowns, a rebuke from God for sailing on the Sabbath. So this is God's displeasure after the introduction of Sunday sailing to the Western Isles of Scotland. The Reverend David Blunt, clerk of the Free Church, continuing of Scotland's North East and Grimsey Presbytery on the island, said an analysis of mechanical failures in the Calmax fleet showed a remarkable difference between the breakdowns before and after Sabbath sailing started in 2009. This is pure propaganda. It has no basis whatsoever. He's even got the day wrong. You remember when the Catholic Church used to put out stories of miracles that happened on this, according to them, the Sabbath, but on Sundays. Yes. To promote it. And we have the same happening today again. Exactly. The weeping statues, all of these things. This is all to create a hype. That's it. Now you've got fleets that's breaking down because you're breaking the Sabbath, according to them. Okay, what is Sunday Reset on TikTok? The Sunday Reset trend on TikTok is practically a movement. It even has an official tagline. Gas prices are likely to continue climbing through 2022. Here's how to save at the pump. So let's see what their solution is. No. When you search the hashtag on the app, the first thing you'll notice is that it has over a whopping 447 million views. It also has a description, unlike other organic hashtags on the platform, whether you're cleaning the house or putting your feet up, it's time for a Sunday re reset. Is it, is it a movement, Martin? Yes, and it's like we've mentioned. You must see this. It's drawn from religious angles and from secular because they're using climate change and all of these. So this is this. Now the Bible clearly says that the beast out of the earth will lead out. And the whole world will follow. So in other words, it has to be a global issue. Yeah. And that means you have to tie something secular to the religious. And climate change is the most obvious at the moment. So in cultures around the world, especially in the U.S., Sundays are preserved for winding down, prepping for the week, resting up, and observing any spiritual practices. On TikTok, people are sharing their Sunday reset routines as inspiration and as ASMR. These relaxing wellness videos make doing your chores look satisfying, but they also turn what's necessary and tedious into a more unified experience. Is there a mass movement to condition humanity in a direction? Oh, for sure. Who controls these medias, Mark? <laughs> Where did they all go and visit? They went all back to the Vatican. Indian Express, Sunday reset to start the week. So is it a global issue? Oh, for, definitely. There's a Hindu nation, right? A declared Hindu nation. Monday morning blues enter the prescription, the Sunday rest. TikTok, the world's biggest trend recorder and unfortunately banned in India, is bustling with the Sunday reset concept with over a billion hits, thousands of tweets, Facebook posts, Instagram videos. It is the internet rage of the day. So what's the Sunday reset? Before heading out to face another stressful week, it is necessary to slow down Empty your physical and mental space by creating a calm physical environment around you. 
You also create calm within. Numerous past studies have shown the value of decluttering life. Does Indian philosophy and yoga and all of that fit into this? Perfectly. I mean, that, create a calm within. You've got Buddhism even inside of this and all of it. Everything is there. A 2011 study by the Journal of Neuroscience concluded that clutter prevents the brain from focusing. So what we should defragment? Mm -hmm. Well, God gave us a day for that. <laughs> yes. And leaves a person with the worry at the back of their mind that there is something they have forgotten to do. The Sunday reset seems to be the solution. Martin, this is all very current. How can people say there's no movement? The problem is because people agree with this. Because the Bible says that you have to rest on the seventh day. The problem is they've got the wrong day. But if they have the wrong day, they have the wrong authority. That is the, yeah, the whole point. That's the point. It's not the day that's the issue. It's coupled to it. Yeah. It's the authority. Who has the say? So let's just remind the viewers that we are dealing with biblical prophecy. We've had these verses on the screen so many times. Let's read them again. And deceiveth. We don't have to go much further, right? No. We, that's exactly what all of this <laughs> is about. Yeah. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Did you see those mega movements with all the hands praying. I mean, my heart goes out to them, but they have a wrong issue. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Roman Catholicism received the mortal wound when its political power was taken away in 1798. That power was partially restored in 1929 when the Vatican again became a political entity. But it didn't have international clout. Now it is not only welcomed in uh, the legislatures of the United States, but it is the spokesperson and the leading figure of the United Nations. And it has actually become part of the political realm of the United Nations. Yes. It actually had its accession, mm. which means it's taking over the kingly role again. So they are going to revive the image of the beast. And this movement that we've just seen, all this talk, the, the, this, these people show you that they are healing the wound completely. They are healing it completely. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So it's going to come to fruition. It's going to happen. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause. That means it has legislative power. That means they will come to power. And cause what? That as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. The Bible says, do you not know that whom you obey, you are servant to? If that person said, you will live under Christian laws. So if you don't want to adhere to that law, you'll be killed or you'll be set out. Correct. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So you have a contrast. You have the world saying, we'll do it. And you have God saying, if you do it, I will pour out my wrath without mercy. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So God will destroy them by fire. Yeah. So Martin, here's the choice. And the world is running into the trap. May God give us wisdom. And I wish we could somehow state it in a way that everybody would get the picture. We are in the most serious time. 
that the world has ever been in in its history. Let's pray. Definitely. Heavenly Father, all of these things are coming to fruition. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet. Without it, we would be lost in a sea of confusion. Lord, open the eyes of your people. You have tried. You gave them the Reformation. You told them who the Antichrist was. You separated the churches. Is it your fault that they have realigned themselves? Error and truth come together? Surely not. Is this warning that you are giving warranted? No, it is an appeal, a final appeal to humanity. Help many to heed it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.